Universal out applies when you've got a universal quantifier as the main connective. So if we have for all x, px, where px really stands for absolutely anything that follows a universal quantifier, what do you do? Drop the quantifier and replace the variable x with a name. And here a equals any name whatsoever. Okay. So this says everything has the property P. Well, if everything's got the property P, then anything that you can name has got it. That's why the rule works. Existential out looks very similar. It says if you have, there is an X PX, well, you get to drop the quantifier and replace the variable with a name. But in this case, you have to be very careful about your choice of names. A here has got to be a new name which means that you have to look at your entire proof, even the conclusion, and make sure that that name doesn't already appear before you choose the name that, uh, that you do. And what we said about this one is A here really doesn't stand for a particular individual. A is kind of a generic name. It's just allowing us to talk about the thing that has the property. It says here that there is something that has the property P. Well, we're just going to use the name A so that we can talk about that something. All right, quantifier exchange. This allows us to deal with dashes in front of quantifiers. So if we have dash for all x, px, then we can move that dash out of the way if we change the quantifier. And that's all that changes in this rule, is dash for all x becomes there is an x dash and then the px part stays exactly the same. This rule has two forms. It also says if you've got a dash in front of an existential, you can make progress by turning it into a universal dash, just like that. Okay, uh, these are our three new rules. We've also got a six-step method, which is an essential part of the predicate logic proof process. And so we'll list all these six steps as we're working on this example. Here's our proof. We have two premises in the conclusion. Let me get my justification column started over here. What is the first step of the method? The first step of the method is to look at the conclusion. If your conclusion has got a quantifier in it, and ours does, a quantifier is either an upside down A or a backwards E, if you've got a quantifier, then you should assume the opposite and do dash out. Let me get my nice box tool over here and set up a good looking box. And what I'm going to do is assume the opposite of this formula. Assuming the opposite of a quantified formula is extremely easy because all you have to do is put a dash in front of it. So we get dash for all x, ax, arrow, cx. Justification, it'll be a provisional assumption for dash out. Getting a little tight over there. So that's what goes on line three. Get rid of that extraneous mark there. Okay, uh, so that's the first step of every predicate logic proof. Assume the opposite of conclusion if it's quantified. Now, if your conclusion didn't have a quantifier in it, you would not need to start off by making this box. Okay, so now the next step. The next step is to do double negation when necessary. So if we had two dashes in front of any of these formulas, we'd do double negation and we'd get rid of those dashes. But we don't have that situation. Steps 3, 4, and 5, this is really the heart of the method. And it's to use our three new rules in the correct order. And here is the correct order. We want to do quantifier exchange, existential out, and then universal out. So let's take a look. Do we have any cases where we need to do quantifier exchange? Clearly we do right here on line three. And let's check this off to show that we're going to work on it. And the reason we obviously need to do quantifier exchange is because we have a dash in front of the quantifier. So we take this formula, and notice this is all that we're going to change. This stuff in the front is all that changes. The rest of the formula comes down exactly as it is. So AX arrow 
cx. All right, and what's the justification? It's line 3 in the rule quantifier exchange. That's all there is to it. There are no more quantifier exchanges to do, so now we're up to existential out. Do we have an existential out? Well, clearly we do, right here on line 4. So let's jump in and work on that. With existential out, the rule says drop the quantifier and then rewrite the rest of the formula, but replace the variable x with a name. What's the restriction on the names? It must be a new name. Let's write that down here by existential out. That's really important. New name when you're doing existential out. What names exist in our proof at this point in time? The answer is none. The capital letters A and C and B, those are not names. Those are actually predicates. The X's, those are not names. Those are variables. So at the moment, there's no names in this proof, so we can choose absolutely any name we want. I say let's go ahead and choose A. Why not? And so that's going to be 4EO. In fact, our whole, you know, the sequence of the rules down here is motivated by the fact that we want to do the existential out early on so we can get these new names into our proof. Okay, so now we're on to universal out. On, we've got two universal outs to do, one and two. Let's work with line one first. The rule says drop the quantifier, rewrite the formula, replacing the variable with a name. It's going to be 1UO. What name should we choose? Well, what names can we choose? The rule tells us that we can choose absolutely any name we want. But in practice, we want to choose a name that's already in our proof, and the only name that's in our proof is A, so that's the name that we should choose. And I hope that you can see this is exactly why the rules are done in this order, because we did the existential out first so we could get a new name into the proof, and now we're going to do the universal outs. So line 7, we're going to work on number 2. I think you know exactly what this is going to be. It'll be BA arrow CA. Justification, 2UO. At this point, you'll notice we have checked off every single line that had a quantifier in it. We are done with the predicate logic part of this proof. Step six is to go back to the old rules. All right, And in fact, at this point, it's like we're starting a new proof. And we have five, six, and seven as our premises. What is our goal? Our goal, of course, is to get to a contradiction. But at this point, it's like we're back to the stuff we were doing in propositional logic. You'll notice that our components, of course, are not simple, are not single capital letters. They're these couplets. But nonetheless, the rules apply in exactly the same way. All right, so looking at lines 5, 6, and 7, is there anything that we can do? Well, line 5 clearly has a dash outside parentheses. That should remind you of De Morgan's and Arrow Exchange. Those are really important derived rules for us at this point. And what are we going to get? AA ampersand dash CA. Justification, 5 AR, 5 arrow exchange. Well, that's obvious. Now we need to do the ampersand out, AA dash CA. 8 ampersand out done twice. And now we've got a couple of options. Probably the easiest thing to do is just to take line 6 and 9 and put it together and get BA. So that would be 6, 9, arrow out, 6, 9, arrow out. And then on line 12, we can do another arrow out here with 7 and 11. Gives us CA, 7, 11, arrow out. And then 13, we should have a contradiction. 10 and 12 would be CA, ampersand, dash, CA. 10, 12, ampersand, in. And what's the justification for the conclusion going to be? The whole box. Line 3 through 13, dash out. All right, that's predicate logic proof. Um, this, this one actually hits all the basics that you know to be able to do predicate logic proofs. Um, all right, let's do another one.